my name is Arnold Huffam. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Wolfgang Luke. Um, who, who in the audience knows Wolfgang? Anybody? So you know I'm not Wolfgang. Um, Wolfgang couldn't be here. He sends his regrets and uh, sends his greetings as well. So before I begin, um, I want to say, say first that I, like others have said before me uh, over the last couple of days, I stand on the shoulders of giants, um, which is kind of a, of a slimy way of saying I'm half, or not even half the scientist that Wolfgang is. Uh, even when I was a scientist, or thought of myself as such, um, some years ago, I wasn't such a great one. Um, and so uh, uh, please bear with me as I wade through some fairly um, dense scientific stuff later on. And, um, and uh, and just to let you know, I, you know, in my conversations with lots of people over the last couple of days, I'm, uh, I'm scared shitless of, of all of you and your science, uh, um, science depth. Um, so my professor during my master's degree told me uh, two things here. One is the world is not as simple as we can think it. And what I take from that in this context is our models will always have errors and we have to understand them. And I think that point has been made um, numerous times over the last two days. And the other one that he taught me, which was very good for me in, in my ex own experimental design and, and, and doing um, and uh, deciding what to do with the data that I collected for my, for my master's in climatology was if in doubt, throw it out. Um, meaning if you doubt the observation, then don't use it. And, uh, and somehow that it perhaps guides us in the use of our remote, remotely sensed data. Um, I will say from my experience in the marketplace over the last 30 years or so is that most or, or may, perhaps even all of our customers use multiple remote sensing data sources in any given project or delivery. And in other words, it's a rare situation that they're using a single data set or a single source and that, uh, and thus, this notion of, of uh, uh, compatibility, interoperability, uh, c comparability of, of different data sets is really important to them. And so it's really great that we're, we're dig digging into it deeply. Um, they go beyond just, I'll say just in quotes, uh, because there's nothing j this, uh, uh, just about Landsat, Sentinel-2, Planet, and DG data. Um, I will say, that over the last two days we've d dwelled ver very much on optical and that's not surprising given the crowd uh, but what about radar uh, and I'll just leave that as a dangling question and then finally a, 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 an issue that came up yesterday is that uh, I represent a commercial software vendor and I'll just say as a matter of principle that commercial software can coexist with free and open source software always has, always will, and, uh, and, and it's just a matter of having a good free and open source software strategy and, and providing good value. So um, this slide, uh, uh, Wolfgang found for, for, uh, for us the very first MSS image, uh, Landsat MSS image in this region. Um, I'm using a term that hasn't been used so far at this conference as far as I know, and that's pixel torture. Um, how many have ever heard that term before? Anybody? No? So uh, um, it's my contention that, that uh, the, the many years of, of, uh, of high-priced data, Landsat, Spot, and so on and so forth, uh, gave rise to a certain kind of uh, uh, image analysis um, process where you would agonize over choosing your imagery and then wring every bit of information you possibly could out of that image. And I refer to that as beating the crap out of an image. Um, and uh, I mentioned that to a colleague at Digital Globe some times ago, and he says, yeah, yeah, we call that pixel torture. So um, uh, hopefully those days are over um, in, as we deal with more and more data. So I'm gonna move uh, a little bit more quickly here. Why analysis ready data? I, I won't go into that um, uh, because I think it's been uh, addressed fairly well. But the focus uh, moves from not just where is the, is the pixel, but to also how much, in other words, how much electromagnetic radiation is being reflected or radiated from the surface, which we want to relate to biophysical properties and surface materials. Uh, and then finally, we want to get, eventually we all want to get to what? Uh, you know, 
a thematic geo, uh, uh, some variable of thematic geospatial information, <laughs> such as a, a yield of tons per hectare in the case of, uh, of agriculture, for example. So why this change uh, in, in the context of PCI geomatics? We're migrating from uh, what we're very, very good at. We have a good international, uh, well-earned reputation for producing geospatially accurate uh, imagery or providing software so that our customers can do that to, to also radiometrically meaningful. Uh, we have been guilty ourselves of, of, of putting a lot of effort into pretty pictures. That's, that's, a, that's a real application. People pay a lot of money to make pretty pictures and we have to, and our, and our customers, many of our customers have, have drawn us to that. And, but along the way, we've also earned a bit of a reputation for being in the pretty picture business as opposed to the science business. And, and we're, uh, we're working hard to uh, dispel that. And so um, here we are with some uh, uh, new development to, to announce. Okay, big data, uh, Landsat and Sentinel. Uh, I think the only thing I want to mention here is that we've got a, we're dw uh, dwelling or operating in a new, in a new space uh, environment such as uh, Planet, EarthCast, EarthEye, um, Astro Digital, Satellogic, triple, triple Sat. If I didn't mention someone that's here, I, I apologize and take responsibility. Uh, I won't spend any time on, on this, but I will mention that, of course, I'm a, uh, others have, met, have done a little bit of advertising, so I'll do that myself. Um, here's a, a very quick rundown on PCI products. On the left, we have a, a well-established uh, desktop product in the marketplace called Geomatica. Uh, in the middle, we have a Gmatica Developer Edition, allows people to do uh, workflow automation from, from those tools. And finally, we uh, have an offering of a, of a GXL, Geoimaging Accelerator product uh, that does high volume production uh, work. Um, these tools are available on desktop and, and, uh, and servers, as well as uh, available in the cloud. And we've developed a way for people to, um, to develop a desktop application and migrate that to the cloud um, where, they might, um, where, they might, uh, where the data might live. A moment on uh, key requirements for open uh, data cube time series analysis. Uh, we start on the left with analysis ready data. We consider this as a, as a cornerstone. There's been some debate so far about uh, 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 machine learning versus uh, science-based or physical physics or physical based approach. Um, my belief to the extent that I can stand on the shoulders of giants as well as be a bit of a scientist myself is that uh, while machine learning may overcome all kinds of uh, issues like for example we heard about atmospheric correction just before that it, the better job you do with, um, um, with atmospheric correction the better those uh, machine learning tools and, uh, and so on will, will, uh, will do. So it's going to be worth the effort. Uh, an acronym on the right, um, my colleague Guillaume um, mentioned this acronym but didn't explain it. Uh, that stands for, MTA stands for multi-temporal ana analysis or multi-temporal analytics. Um, so some requirements for ARD, automation processes and the characteristics of uh, characterization of measurement, um, temporally, spatially, spectrally, uh, angular um, characterization, even polarization, quite common in, uh, in radar. Um, uh, and uh, I understand there's no reason why we couldn't think about polarized light in the optical world as, a, as an acquisition parameter. Um, and in, in all of this, we have to have a sufficient understanding and measurement of radi radi uh, excuse me, radiative transfer functions. Um, Important aspects of analysis-ready data, metadata. Uh, we believe that uh, in order to do mo proper multi-temporal analytics and, and analysis of stacked pixels, that we need um, super registration to a tenth of a pixel or better. Um, we need to uh, have a, spectral, a spectrally preserving uh, image function or fusion function. And we need um, uh, uh, radiometrically normalized uh, data using spectral preclassifications, radiance and top of atmosphere reflectance, atmospheric corrected, topographically normalized and BRDF <laughs> corrected. That's a tall order. We, and, and some of our, our previous speakers have drilled down into, into one uh, or, or other aspect of this. We heard about, um, in the previous talks, we heard about uh, very, a very big drill down on atmospheric correction as well as uh, uh, the, the cloud and haze uh, detection. We, um, we 
showed a couple of days ago a, a, an example multi-sensor ARD workflow. Uh, and uh, we have it here. I think the point I want to make about this is not to drill down too much, too deeply into the order of operations and, uh, and how these things are constructed at the moment. But I, wa I want to mention that in, in our offerings, we offer the capability to offer a complete workflow like this. Or if there was one element of our technology that you wanted to use, we would offer that as a, as a single unit and you could plug that into your workflow. Um, uh, alternatively, if you wanted to plug a particular unit of, of your um, technology into our workflow, we could take out, for example, our atmospheric correction and plug in yours and still the whole workflow would work. And so um, we, we offer an open system in that regard. So we start with uh, ingest. I'll say when we started on this project around, uh, um, uh, around ARD, we, we really had to, to, to scrub and, and, and look at our um, uh, metadata handling um, technology, and that took a, a lot of housekeeping to get that right so that you could preserve your, your metadata properly and to the, to the point necessary that our customers would need. So we started with ingest. Um, MRA, MRA Fusion, we've developed new technology around uh, um, uh, pen sharpening that um, ours and others have, have, have suffered from not preserving spectral characteristics of the multispectral components of the, of the, um, of the fusion um, as we introduce the high spatial um, resolution data. And uh, we think that we've come up with something um, that, that uh, is, is really good. Um, we offer uh, in this workflow spectral pre-classification, and I'll talk about what, how and why that's used later. Uh, we also think that super registration is really important. We've seen some information that talks, that shows that even after orthorectification and under certain conditions, um, when ground control um, or, or uh, tie points um, in a, uh, block bundle adjustment aren't, uh, aren't necessarily available, um, but perhaps those points are under cloud and so on, that, uh, that we end up with some fairly significant misregistrations in the ortho images. And as we stack the images up uh, in multi-temporal uh, way, that we essentially end up with uh, by uh, seeing misregistrations as opposed to uh, looking at uh, matched pixels in a stack. And so we we, uh, it, it, although we're very good at orthorectification, offering re orthorectification capability and multi-sensors, uh, we're also now offering a capability to do super registration and local adjustments of those, of those pixels. Um, uh, sensor co uh, cross calibration, we did a project with uh, the Planet people um, in South America and, and, and uh, doing sensor cross calibration between uh, Planet Scope and, and Sentinel-2, in this case uh, using um, uh, um, NDBIs uh, that were calculated or, or derived from each of these products. Um, atmospheric correction, I'm not going to spend time here but uh, because I'm going to look into the validation a little bit later on. And here we see the, uh, the effects of BRDF on the left and a correction of that BRDF on the right. This, in this case, is actually with aerial data over, over Vancouver. Topographic normalization. On the left, we see uh, a strong topographic effect in an uncorrected image. This is in South Africa. Um, and on the right, a, a topographically normalized image um, uh, where, uh, in this case, also BRDF and skylight sensitive uh, um, uh, uh, topographic normalization is, has been done. And you can see the differences in the uh, in the, in the contrast on the left, uh, while it may be a visually appealing image from a scientific point of view, it's got some, some shaded and, and uh, illuminated uh, um, slopes. Thank you. Okay, so I move quickly on to validation of algorithms. This is the tough part for me. This is the hard science part, and uh, maybe it's best that I only have five minutes left. <laughs> um, so I'll just skip ahead and, uh, and look at an image fusion quantitative comparison in the middle. In, on the left, we, we see the original reflectance scaled um, imagery and, and, and a false color composite. In the middle, a, U, a, a, a pen sharp using a UNB algorithm um, and, in the, and, and, and uh, has a lot of similarities to some, some old technology that PCI offered. 
And on the right, we have uh, M MRA fusion, and you can see the quite quite quickly and easily the the, the difference. Um, standard deviation um, between the inputs on the from the multispectral on the left and on the right and on the after fusion are are quite startling. Um, uh, we suggest and and uh, um, offer a, a, a spectral pre-classification um, in the uh, in the workflow. Uh, we, this shows um, the use of it. It's multi-sensor and so on. I'll just move quickly. Uh, we call this the, this this uh, uh, spectral classification spec class. Uh, one of the ways it's used is uh, is for cloud detection and um, and and water masking. And on the left, we see the original imagery on uh, Landsat 8. In the middle, uh, USGS ARD, and we uh, using um, one of their algorithms. And on the right. Um, we think that our, our, uh, uh, our clouds are de detected well um, and, uh, and the haze not characterized. Now this brings up an interesting point that was raised earlier and that was the tunability of these, uh, of these um, algorithms. Uh, someone said they wanted to have some dials to, 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 to tune. Uh, some people might uh, want to uh, over, over um, remove uh, more, more cloud and uh, error on the side of, uh, of caution, and others would want to make sure that they weren't missing valuable information under, underneath uh, cloud. So it's our intent in the fullness of time to offer that tunability of those, of those uh, algorithms. Uh, screaming through this, we see, uh, uh, we see that the more spectral channels we have uh, in, in appropriate uh, spectral ranges, the better and better the, the, the uh, pre-spectral classification can get, especially around cloud uh, and, and haze detection and, uh, and so on. So um, to make the point about uh, the importance of, 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 uh, of localized uh, image shifting to, to, to line up pixels, uh, what we did here was uh, we did a, a, a one-third pixel offset uh, and see the, the noise that results. Uh, so that's the, that's the black and white image you see in the middle there. Um, and then the histogram stats on, on, on the right. And they, they should be, uh, it, w without the one-third pixel offset in a, in a um, uh, constructed image, we would see uh, all the images lining up at the, at the zero line in the, in the, in the, in the spectrum there. Uh, this results in some uh, geometric co-registration statistics. At uh, one pixel offset, we're looking at 8% um, um, error in the, in the pixel values. We get it down to a tenth of a pixel, we're at the 1% range, starting to get into the acceptable range. And if we could do better, it's, uh, it drops down under a pixel. Uh, and and in, un, sorry, in previously orthorectified image, it, we could, if you were able to zoom in on the right-hand uh, um, uh, chart there, you would see that each of these represent um, um, uh, offset vectors. And you'll find that it's non-systematic. In other words, it's not easily modeled, and that's and hence gives forth to the need for a localized pixel shifting um, amongst in the image stack. Radiometric normalization. How's my time? Yeah, about a minute. About a minute. That's about right. Um, radiometric normalization um, uh, and two uh, two new algorithms that we're introducing. Uh, actually, three uh, reflectance pixel-based solar viewing and geometry based on zenith and azimuth. Uh, digital number to radiance for any sensor, uh, digital number to reflectance for any sensor, um, and so on. So here's an example of the uh, solar view um, uh, elevation and, and azimuth uh, correction being applied. Uh, digital number to reflectance, digital number to radiance. I'm not treating this uh, especially well. Um, and an example spectral plot. Atmospheric correction and validation we see uh, uh, Landsat 8 um, and Sentinel-2 uh, images collected almost exactly the same time. And then uh, atmospheric correction validation on the left, uh, very, very new information that was uh, only collected yesterday. We're getting uh, our value of 0.918, not quite at the same level as uh, USGS ARD La Source validated against the spectral library and not quite what Centicore validated against the spectral library at 0.96, um, but uh, quite respectable for the, for the new software. 
A fully automated atmospheric correction is our objective and, and lists all that, uh, all that you see there. I heard the alarm, yeah. <laughs> Uh, topographic normalization, very quickly, uh, using SRTM 30 meter information on the left, we see uncorrected um, uh, topographic normalized data. On the right is, uh, is the PCI method. And here we have a comparison on the left, the uncorrected. On the right, um, the PCI method in the middle of sent is sent to core. It's um, under, under correcting the, uh, uh, um, the, the, uh, the data for um, or uh, solar illumination effects. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is using that spectral classification, pre-classification, and uh, the contention is that um, the, the um, topographic normalization has to be done on a class-by-class uh, -class basis, um, and uh, I think that point was made earlier as well. Here we have uh, a comparison of uh, Santicor to the PCI method, um, and uh, uh, we think that our method is, um, is doing um, by far and away the best um, topographic normalization in this comparison. Next step in the process and according to the workflow is ingestion of the data cube and uh, uh, it's in relationship with the open data cube that I uh, it was mentioned before. Digging in a little bit to the uh, in comparison amongst the methods. Um, and the, I would say the biggest piece of unfinished work in, in, our, in our new offering is uh, the BRDF. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's empirical and, and uh, the physical models are, are coming soon in, in, uh, in new releases. So back to advertising just a minute. Um, our at course offer has been in commercial release for many, many, many years uh, uh, based upon uh, uh, DLR uh, technology. Um, our version one ARD elements will be available with our Geomatica GXL uh, release in 2018 later this month uh, and a physical BRDF solution in the service pack. Uh, these are going to be deployed as what we call PCI pluggable functions. Um, and so these things can be plugged into your workflow or we can construct a workflow based upon, upon your requirements. Thus it says that GXL workflow is on demand. And, uh, um, Where's George? George Percival um, suggests that uh, uh, people don't talk about the roadmap. Uh, here's our roadmap for this particular uh, subject, subject area. Um, and uh, uh, we hope to integrate uh, new cutting edge technologies as well as uh, uh, previously signed, uh, uh, validated scientific uh, work. And uh, we're not ignoring the radar, that I, the question that I asked off the top. So a couple minutes over, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Arnold. And I think we have Matthew next, and then we'll. I think we don't have a uh, laptop change, so this will be a quick. Yeah. Switch over. Okay, so I will speak today about uh, an approach where take it from another field and we bring it, it in remote sensing to see what we, it's possible to do. And we do that, we use these methods to do colorization. So the goal is this one, is we have a gray image, panchromatic uh, band, and we want to have a color one or even extract a near infrared uh, channel. So first, uh, a small story about the, the method. The method is coming from uh, underground uh, exploration, mining and petroleum exploration. And what they are doing, they are doing in some places and they want to know between these places how it looks like. So they use a, what we call a training image. It's a place that they know is quite similar. So here it's like about uh, knowing uh, the underground water, so they have some channel and they do like some uh, drilling. They, are, they want to know in a given place, knowing some drilling or exploration around, and uh, they want to know the value at this place. But they don't want to drill everywhere because it's very expensive. So what they do, they are looking to find similar uh, pattern in the training image and training data sets that they have. One time they have it, they just say the value is similar. One time they did that, they start again with another position, and at the end they finish with many simulations. So they do one after the other, 
and they stack them and they do statistics on it. So some places we are always finding that it will give a channel, so we are quite sure here it would be a channel. Some other place never channel and some place we just don't know. So what I will present is fully statistical and all these uh, results have a, um, a level of quality of certainty. So this method was recently used to fill gaps, typically in uh, Landsat 7 uh, image. So the question, I was surprised that no one speak about it like uh, the previous day, but if you have a pixel with dead in a sensor, how you do it? So if it's like uh, Sentinel or Landsat, I mean, you have a, a long line with missing. In uh, Landsat 7, you have these bands. And uh, so we have a bunch of algorithms nowadays who are just uh, we need a full image. We are not really able to handle missing data. So what we propose is just to fill the, fill the images with what it can be. So we do usually many simulations, and after we have many transfer functions, and we do statistics on, on the output. So that's a typical output of, of filling the gap. So we can still see the lines, but most of algorithms will prefer these that black lines. In my particular case, I'm looking on colorization. So how we see the, the process in, it's like usually you have your, your standard inputs that coming from whatever sensor with correction done and everything. And after you have a standard processing pipeline where you're doing classification or something else, and you have your expected output and you, you train it and it works very well. If suddenly you change of, of capture of sensor, you have uh, some other input you go to the same standard uh, processing pipeline, definitely results are really wrong. So the idea we have is just to, to uh, take this exotic uh, input, to modify them, to make them acceptable, comparable to the standard input you have before, and that you can again uh, set to the standard processing channel. So, why we need that? Because typically we have a bunch of different sensors, how we hear this uh, few last day. But um, historically, we have a lot of data who are very different of nowadays. And uh, we want to use this uh, data if we are lo looking for long-term change and so on. These first few data are very important. And typically, we have like uh, old image like coronas. So, just, uh, so the first one is... Uh, a planet uh, very recent, like from one week, so I, I take it uh, two days ago. And next to it is like um, an image uh, from, uh, I think yeah, it's a corona, in all cases, declassified uh, collection from spy satellites. And uh, we see that there are, at this time, high resolution, at least, I mean, as good as we have nowadays with uh, satellites. And we want to use this image, but the problem is this image we have only like gray. And it's even often not a really controlled gray. So we need to improve this image to bring them to the same level as no day image that we can use it. Just for the anecdote, like two days ago, we see a presentation about um, cosine. We are saying that they are, it's give a, an issue with sending all the data back to Earth. And at this time, they have the same issue. They have a lot of data and uh, don't know how to send it back to Earth. So how they did it, they just send back physically the data in a small capsule and take it with an airplane. So yeah, just for the, for the small story. So how we plan to do this uh, colorization? So we plan to look to find a pattern from so sec some texture like forest or, or whatever we, we have. We are looking in another image where we, have, we know all the information, where we have all the bands. We are looking to find similar patterns. And one time we find it, we will just say, okay, this one is the same, so we will import back the, the information and construct slowly, slowly the, the correlation. So it gives two, two different problems, and one is much harder than the other. So the first one is like when we have a panchromatic band and we try to find colors. I mean, the information is here, it just aggregate together. So it's a little challenging, but it's, it's still possible, and typically uh, RGB are well uh, um, are quite similar, so we can very easily do this operation. But this one with more challenging is like when we try to extrapolate. So we know only the gray and we try to know the infrared. And that's what we call uh, extrapolation. That's a much harder task. So 
just quickly, I will present the data set. So the data set I use, it's um, in uh, Switzerland, in the Swiss plateau. So we have some forest, we have some river, we have a lot of fields and some small cities. So that's what we have at training image. So we suppose these two and the near infrared here as known. And what we are trying to reconstruct is this one and this one, knowing only this one here. So we apply the, the process I showed before of looking for each pattern and importing the central value of, uh, of the color. And that's what we, what we finally get. So I just put the truth as, as reference. And you, some places are m more easy than others. Like for example, forests are straightforward, fields are not too hard, but like cities, it's really, it's really challenging. So that's the easy case of uh, colonization and is really very easy. Now I will present the result of, our, of uh, the most challenging part of this extrapolating, extracting a new band where we don't have the original information. And that's what we can expect as near infrared. So I remember, it's, it's not the truth. It's just not really a guess, but it's the best we can expect knowing the texture of it. So it's very when we have, like, for example, a classification, we learn about like, Landsat, and we suddenly want to use another data set, and we don't have uh, this information, but the classifier requests it. So we need to, to find a way to, to have an artificial of this, this band. And earlier results show very good, uh, satisfying result about classification using this as input. So even, like, for example, on forest is not as good, I mean, when we classify after forest is forest, or even if it's another one, it, it works well. So this method are coming with a quality measurement or uncertainty. And uh, we speak this uh, few last days about, about it a few times. So all the methods we have can be, uh, we can extract uh, an uncertainty by doing many simulations. But some of this method, and specifically this one used, are coming with a uh, quality measurement. So it's not straightforward uh, an uncertainty, but it's like a, a good proxy to it. So here we can see like in black the forest that are very easy to, to define and a really good quality. And some other places were typically here in white and here or, or here were at the end of the simulation. So that's the quality we evolve over the, the, the simulation. So we do place one more certain first. Starting from the end here, I mean, Seriously, value are, are just bullshit. We just feel with what we have that the, the um, forward model after don't crash, in fact. But we know they are very bad, and if we do statistics over it, each time we have another value. But still, we have like 99% of the, of the whole image with of good quality. And more recently, what we are working on is that uh, to set it automatically, this method. Because the problem is that this methods are coming from uh, underground, and they really like to tune it with that, yeah, I know I want a little more of this, a little more of that, because usually they have expert knowledge of people who say, yeah, here we give as, as much of, uh, of uh, iron or whatever they are mining. But in, in this context, we are looking more for something fully automatic, that we are just putting the training image and is what we are looking for in the system, and we run and we have an output with usable. So we did some tests, and uh, that if we use a, almost a random calibration, which in fact is not random, but it, it's uh, the most acceptable, with not specialized uh, for, a, for a given area, we, we, give, we, we, have, sorry, we have this error. And when an expert sets the method, we, we get this one. We, like, you need like two hours of settings to find this this nice value, so you're, you're struggling a lot, but one time you have it, you can use it uh, for many times. And that's what the automatic setting give us, so we are really impressed of it, and we are looking forward on improving uh, this, uh, this part. Uh, it still requires a lot of computation, for example, to, to get this uh, nice result, we are computing during a full day over four computer, uh, good ones. To, to get uh, the, the result. So we see that after half of simulation, it will be possible to, to stop and have something acceptable. But uh, still, it requests a lot of computation. And we are trying to know, we know it's working. We are trying to find a way to, to go faster on it. How am I with the time? About eight minutes. 
are still. So I will go to s quickly to some other stuff. So what people in uh, some colleagues are doing, it's uh, to apply si similar methods to do other tasks. So here what we are trying to do is uh, we, we use a, um, a world view uh, image over, uh, where was it? Somewhere in Africa. And uh, we use the planet with a low resolution uh, with it. So the planet one is known everywhere and the world view is only known on the top part. And we are trying to reconstruct artificially uh, high resolution one. So it's not really as pen sharpening, but the idea is here. We, we are taking advantage of both, but here we don't need to have the, the information at the same place. We are looking to find similar places and we import the, the information. And some other uh, stuff some people in my group are working on is like to improve uh, resolution about DMs. So typically we have like using SRTM uh, as, a, as DM, problem is that often is not good enough and even, I mean, is like almost 20 years old now and some places change. Okay, geology go very slowly, but like if you are looking in, in mountains, you have sometimes like a, a glacier we retreat and like you have a, a gap of 100 meters. So, so sometimes you need to, to correct it. So what we are doing using same approach of uh, similar uh, DMs that we know in high resolution, typically done by photogrammetry or, or so on. We are slowly improve it and uh, looking to, to get uh, some good results. So here all the images are shown only the residual part because in the case with, um, with the elevation, we, we don't see really the, the, the result. So what is given detail more with the trend? So with the trend, we have usually that in as a certain. So for sure, we can interpolate it, but we, if we take really the pixel as it is, we, we have something like that. And what we get after uh, improving uh, uh, the result is something similar as that. So again, it's a statistical approach. So maybe here it don't give a small hill, but if we do like uh, 100 tests and we have always a hill, it's that it's for sure it give a hill there. And that's basically it. So uh, what we can do with uh, these uh, tools of MPS is uh, to standardize it. I show it for using uh, all for old image, but we can use it for recent one from new sensor just to harmonize it. We can extract new bands if, uh, if it's needed for the processing that we do, we do after. And uh, we can fix uh, small issues like gaps or dead pixels in, in the picture. Or just filling, we are another stuff we are starting to explore is to filling gaps in clouds if we need to have an image of this given day. But still, it's prototyping. So thanks everyone and I suppose we go for the talk and, and uh, questions. Thank you, Matthew. And if we can get uh, Arnold and Matthew to sit up front again and uh, again, come over to the mic stand if you have any questions to ask. Anybody? Uh, yeah, I had a question for uh, Matthew. Um, I'm curious about the, uh, the the use of simulating these data instead of using priors for you know you you might have a deep stack. Uh, for an area uh, over time. If you're looking back in time, you have the deep stack forward in time, you know, many observations from Landsat or whatever. Um, in terms of using the actual spatial co-location looking back in time instead of simulating statistically what something might look like. Is, it, is that uh, a well-formed question? Is that I'm not so sure to re-understood it, but I suppose you mean why to just don't take an old pixel and put it at the at this place and not 
looking one for somewhere else in space. Is what yeah, you if mean? You're, if you're, say if you're looking statistically, has did this place look different in 1983 from this corona image, say, um, looking backwards in time, you have this, this history of, of other sensors uh, over time that have actually looked at the same place, you know, that, that I as opposed to similar places that you're statistically simulating. So, so, so if we are going forward in the time, if we look at not for actual image, but yeah. old image, I mean, if they construct a building since, I mean, we will never know what was here before. So we definitely need to look in another place in space. After the, the other issue, even if we just look the stack and we don't really use the space, it's around, it's that we maybe will import a pixel of a crop in a field of grass so that we don't want. So we want to have this, that the neighborhood is consistent. And when it's the whole neighborhood is missing, you need to, to go s looking somewhere else because you don't know how to bring them together. Um, another question from Matthew. Uh, what is the size of the, let's say, texture patch that you are looking for in the, uh, in the reference data? So it's a good question. And uh, typically the question of auto settings is to find the the optimal uh, patch size with the optimal weighting for each neighbor and so on. And it's not big, it's around like a patch of 7.7 seven or 9.9. Nine. So it's really the, the close neighborhood is important. And typically we see that more far we are going from the center, less important it is. So it's, it's really that the pixel in the middle is important and the few neighbor around. Um, is this Method something that you developed yourself, or so it's based you on the method that we we bring it from uh, underground study. But yeah, we optimize it to be able to work with uh, fully known uh, information in space because th they don't have that. They they always have some few data, and here we have like uh, we know the gray everywhere. So we need to make this uh, method working for for this situation. And after we just optimize it in the case to, to reduce the, the variability to only what is needed and what makes sense. So yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and the, the code will be available soon, like in it's open source. <laughs> There's a question for Arnold. Um, you talked a bit about uh, some of the algorithms working for any sensor and the work that went into the ingestion process to capture appropriate metadata. I wonder what you can talk, uh, what you could say maybe towards um, given very heterogeneous sets of sensors from different organizations, um, you know, what metadata we ought to be providing and maybe what the challenges are of building sort of useful processing chains that work on very heterogeneous kinds of sensors. Um, Frank, could you give me an example? Um, so you're, you're asking me, let me see how you put the question in my own words. You're asking me how easy is it to um, adapt a quote any sensor or a new sensor to the to the tools that were um, or or vice versa our, our tools. Well, maybe to if we narrowed in on the you mentioned there's a lot of work on ingestion to capture metadata. So presumably there is some like core set of metadata you decided that was necessary for sensors, and then you like adapt the ingesters for different things to capture that. I'm wondering if there's parts of that that might be you know surprising or that you could mention. Guillaume, do you have any comment? Yeah. I would <laughs> I stand on the shoulders of giants. Right? <laughs> uh, I mean, one, we absolutely need. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So, if you're talking about, let's say, spectral classification, what you absolutely need is uh, at least four bands red, green, blue, and near. Three, three, if you can get rid of the blue. Uh, and some information about the wavelengths. That's minimum core that what we need. Uh, the more information you provide, the more we can do. It. We, we try, the, that's our sensor approach is, you know, we gotta work the base minimum, and the more information you provide, the more we can give back. Uh, more classes, for example, if you stay with the spectral classification, um, we can segregate things more easily. So if you give me the minimum information, I can tell you if it's, it's vegetation or soil. If you, if you give me, uh, I don't wanna say something stupid, but for example, uh, uh, a short wave, if I can tell you if it's uh, bright soil, 
fair soil or senescent vegetation versus uh, dead vegetation, those kind of things. The more, the more information you provide, the more we can give back. But we're gonna have, have a minimum set. Does that answer your question? Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what vendors could do to uh, provide metadata that would help you better describe their sensors, so that would be useful. Um, I mean, <laughs> again, the more information you provide, the better it is. Uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, right now we commercial sensor do a reasonably good job at uh, providing the information we need. Uh, as a, if, if you go deeper into research, uh, having uh, a spectral response function would help, definitely. Uh, uh, a characterization of the MTF would, would help as well for really working on 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 other things. I know there's things that. Not only are publicly available and sensitive, but that's the kind of thing that would help for sure. Also, point spread function, I'm told. Yeah, point. Well, well that's yeah. the inverse. MTF. So yeah. 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 A couple of follow up questions. So, going back to the um, uh, all the beautiful canisters of film that are sitting at the basement of ERAS. Um, is it interesting to the community to fund the digitization of that entire archive? Because I mean, I, my understanding when I was there is that only a small portion of that imagery is actually digitized, and fully digitizing the archive will be just a few hundred thousand dollars, and that would provide like a baseline, at least a spatial, not a spectral, going back into I guess the 60s. So I mean, what do we think? I mean, is that worth doing, or? For me as researcher, I would say yes, definitely. <laughs> any, any other thoughts on that? I, if I don't pay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to answer that question a, in a little bit differently. We offer a, a completely different pro product called Historical or Photo Processing System, um, which allows you to take scanned aerial photography, whether it's film or print, and essentially turn it into a, a color balanced ortho mosaic of your, st of your area. Um, and there's, uh, well, speaking for the National Air Photo Library alone in, in, uh, in Ottawa, uh, there's some six million photographs in that, in that, uh, in that archive. Uh, that's a national level archive. Um, in the United States, there's uh, numerous um, historical archi archives uh, at the national level, and then you go down to, say, the, the uh, Department of Transports, uh, each of them have and, and departments of forestry and so on, they, they each have their own archives of, uh, of, of collects. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest in, is, and I would say especially at the, at the, uh, at the local level, uh, municip municipal level, to bring those archives into the digital world, um, at least as a, as a, as a backdrop, and, and, and some are doing some quantitative uh, uh, historical change analysis with, with those things. Yeah. Interesting. Any other thoughts on that theme? I guess another question I have is more on the interaction between, uh, I guess, the trial of open source commercial code and cloud. I mean, is, is are companies like PCI thinking about, you know, containerizing and serving essentially the building blocks of those pipelines in a way that can be consumed in places like AWS, like an appliance, I can drag and drop into my pipeline a PCI appliance for orthoing, is a clear transparency on the pricing, is the same for everybody, and is, uh, are we on that path or of actually having an ecosystem of appliances that sit on Google Compute Platform or AWS where you can spin up your pipeline on demand, mixing and matching blocks from PCI, open source, in the same pipeline, is that something you guys I've looked, I've looked at. We, we are on that path. Um, uh, it, there's, a, there's a tipping point at some point between um, whether these things, uh, uh, whether this appliance, as you put it, this function can, can be used generically by, by uh, lots and lots of people. And people are looking for the killer app, if you like, that, uh, that it would be simple to use and applicable to everyone. Um, uh, what we're seeing more often is, uh, is, is more private cloud applications where people are, um, as you say, spinning up their application, their whole workflow, 
um, and uh, migrating it from the desktop to the cloud to, um, to get close to the data. Um, and it's not sort of uh, uh, made public to everyone. It's, it's more uh, you know, our, our customers are interested in preserving their secret sauce, which is the way they string these things together and the value add that they bring. Um, and just putting that, um, that appliance, as you put it, out for everyone to use equally um, doesn't fit a lot of people's business models. Uh, oh, no, or, I mean, or, I, or put it put a different way, yeah. there's a tipping point where people will start to pay um, a little bit for the use of the algorithm um, once or twice as opposed to acquiring the algorithm, the, the function, the, the process, um, and using it to their own advantage um, over a period of time. Yeah, yeah I think in a scenario that makes a little sense is producing baseline products using the open source code base but be able to serve on demand, you know, a essentially <laughs> premium products that might use maybe some of the PCI offerings, but being able to programmatically link that through a very super, you know, transparent pricing scheme that allows you to say, well, this guy ordered the better version of topographic correction, we'll spin up the appliance and hook it up to our own pipeline, but only serve those three images, process like that, and we pay for those cycles of CPU, and, and then we can essentially just do that, and right. but you know, being we need interoperability at every single level to be able to do that. So we're open to the business, um, and the question is, when when does it flip from being marketing and exposure to uh, to a business? Yeah. Right. All right. All right, I think uh, there's not a line over here, so I think that was all the questions. Thank you, too, very much once again. Thanks. And uh, Sibo, and uh, we can get you set up, and everyone can take a five-minute quick break and uh, get back in here for the last morning session. <laughs>